And worship team, thank you um, for leading us. And I don't know if you picked it up or not, but I couldn't help but thinking when we were singing the songs, we sang this. There's no silver or gold or treasures untold that could draw me away from your heart. All that I am, I lay at your feet. We sang that. We sang that loudly and boldly. And I want to challenge and say, really? Are we really willing to be able to say that and declare that? There's no silver or gold or treasures untold that could draw me away from your heart. It's really what we were talking about last week, if you were here. Interesting discussions with a number of people this last week. And uh, there's always, when we talk about money, there's always people that kind of push back and say, there's so many more things we need to be preaching and talking about and all that kind of stuff. And, and one thing that I will answer back all the time, and I think I said last week, is every page of Scripture is equally as valuable as every other page. And as we look through Scripture, the idea or the discussion on money is over 800 times. That's the second most talked about topic in the entire Bible. And yet we avoid it from the platform a lot. When we add to money, we add the ideas of wealth or possessions or poverty or gold or silver or generosity. There's over 2,000 references in Scripture. Now, my Bible is 1,362 pages. If there's over 2,000 references to money or wealth or possessions, I'm not good at math, but that seems like it must be on more than every page, right? On a lot of pages, twice. Why? Why did Jesus talk about money more than he talked about heaven and earth? He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I said last week, he didn't say where your heart is, your treasure will be. These two things are, are, are so connected. What God is asking us as we did that series through John, that the transformation on the inside, as, as we surrender to God and he changes us from the inside out, our hearts and our wallets are so interconnected. That when our wallet becomes heavier, our heart becomes lighter. I, want not, no, I don't want my heart to be heavy. That just came out wrong. I, I want my heart to be the balance of that. My wallet being connected and following that. Last week, really quickly to catch you up, because it was a continuation type thing. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 6, we read, Bring your offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes, and the contribution you present, and your vow offerings, and your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. A lot more expected than just the tithe, the 10% we set aside for God. We talked about the idea of uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, where we declare the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. How everything here belongs to him. And we're returning to him. If I really believed that, then I'd be able to say, my truck is not my truck. It's God's truck. And if you want to borrow it at any time, ask. Because it's his truck. Will we live that way? It seems to be that the, in the Old Testament, which we looked at last time, that the honest tithe is the whole tithe. It's 10% plus our offerings and our giving to other ministries and our care and our support. The whole tithe given in the right place. We read the scripture, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That went to pay the day-to-day -day ministry of the temple and to pay the Levites and the priests so they could live. And then returning to God from the right motives with a heart full of love and gratitude. This was not law. It was turned into law. We are released from the law for us. This is not legalistic. It's not law. It's not an expectation to tithe to be part of our church or to follow Christ. 
It's a practice of generosity to honor God from thankful hearts. And that's what it was before it came law. That's where we left it off last week. And I didn't, I don't remember a whole lot of things about this that I learned from my father. He died when I was 16 years old. And after he died, and I remember conversations with my mother about this and about how we operated, and she's told me a number of things, together with the things that I observed, this is the picture that I I got growing up. We were not a wealthy family, we weren't poor, but we never had excess. I remember we had to borrow money to go on vacation, and my dad would work extra hard to pay that off, to recoup that. But he believed and he acted in a way that demonstrated that he believed that God would care for us, that we would have what we needed. But that did not remove the need for hard and diligent work. My dad decided early that he was going to give 15% off the top, not 10. And in a family where we didn't have a lot, that was hard often. On top of that, we sponsored missionaries. And on top of that, we sponsored children around the world every week I remember Mr. Ballard I have no idea what our connection with him was but every week one day my dad would drive and pick him up he was an older man mostly crippled very feeble and he my dad would pick him up bring him over for supper and we would feed him and enjoy a time together and then my dad would take him back I have no idea where or how or who but every week for years I remember that I remember my dad also said he was going to tithe his time. What does that look like? So 10% of his time, if we did it on a daily basis, that's two and a half hours. I didn't do the math to a week, but he would tithe his time in service to the church and to God. And he lived that way. And it was all out of a heart of thanksgiving, a sacrifice for ministry, for love of people, and out of the depth of love for God. So to say, in summarizing last week, to say that tithing is the ideal simply does not capture the breadth or the depth of what the Old Testament teaches and certainly doesn't capture that for the New Testament. I want us today to take a quick run through the New Testament. I'm not going to say a lot, but I want to read a lot of scripture. And as it says in Hebrews, that the word of God is living and active, right? And able to divide soul and spirit and bone and marrow to cut right to us. And and my prayer is this morning that as we look at a lot of scriptures, that God just pokes each one of us in the chest, maybe in very different ways, but to move us forward with a heart of discipleship, and following Christ and becoming like him. And if the guys upstairs can keep up, I want to go through a whole bunch of scriptures here. They should appear on the back. First Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. This is a conversation with the rich young ruler that Jesus has. And here's a guy who is living for God. He's doing everything right. And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. That's 100%. That's not 10%. What Jesus is asking from him is 100%. And in Luke 14, the same picture as he's speaking to others. He said, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's 100%. John, in Luke chapter 3, verse 11, baptizing people. People are coming back to him saying, okay, now what do we do? This is what he said. Whoever has two coats is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food, let him do likewise. Obviously, that's not talking about percentages of my income. It's way beyond that. It's an attitude and an action. And interestingly interestingly here, what's the first thing we do now? Generosity. I remember when I was a young pastor in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and the first winter I lived there, 
I came from Ontario and I moved to uh, that part of Saskatchewan the first, November 1st, I landed. It was minus 47. And for the first month I lived there, it never got above minus 40. Well, I had this little Ontario winter jacket. The people bought me this parka and it weighed like 40 pounds. I remember that really vividly. And I remember one day that winter, and I was wearing a jacket I had just bought. It wasn't that parka. I was wearing this brand new jacket. I loved that jacket. And I'm walking down the street, and it was a cold, windy day, and there's a pickup truck sitting on the side of the road, and there was two young, well, a kid and a teenager sitting in the back. The teenager had a good jacket on, and the kid, maybe eight or nine years old, in there did not have a jacket on. And just sitting there shivering. And as I walked past that, past that truck, I felt strongly in my heart that God was saying, give him your jacket. And I walked right past and went into the restaurant. When I came back out after I couldn't get it out of my head, I walked past and the, 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 they were gone. And I realized, oh, I forgot my jacket. I ran back into the restaurant and it was gone. I've never been able to forget that. Why didn't I just give him my jacket? Why, why, why don't we just assume that when, when, when we feel that way, when we think that way, that why don't we just assume that that is God speaking? And just be obedient. What kind of blessing does God have for us? Let's continue on. Luke, 8, or Luke 19, verse 8. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stood... And said to the Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Nobody asked him to do that. This wasn't the law. It wasn't a requirement. It was just out out of the response of the transformation of his heart. This is the original Old Testament attitude we looked at last week. Acts chapter 2. All who believed were gathered together. And had all things in common. And they were selling the possessions and belongings and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Same ideas continued on a couple of chapters later in Acts 4. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands and houses, they sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. These people lived in their own homes, but every day together. They ate together, they spent time together, they worshiped together, they learned together, and and this was everything to them. This was a completely new, different way of living, countercultural, and it was a culture then that they were generating of generosity and sharing and caring. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you may always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work. New Testament continues on, and we could read all morning if we wanted to. Let me settle on one passage. If you have your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 6. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And if I had to summarize this section of the Sermon on the Mount, I would say this. Run after the kingdom of God, not after the traps of this world. Last week, I left you with this challenge. There was three things. How does the tithe fit into your picture? Whether you're a kid or an adult, how does the tithe fit into your life and your picture? How are you treating any other giving for the poor or their shoeboxes or tie to or the Salvation Army? Are we mixing up the tithe and the offerings and the special projects? The Old Testament broke those out so clearly last week. And in what ways are we living in dependence on God, on God and actually pursuing that? And are we giving out of a reflection of how we've been blessed? 
So Matthew chapter 6, this is the, the passage that Billy read for us a few minutes ago. So I won't read the whole thing, but I want to touch on some of it because I want to look at some of the words that are here. And as I studied this this week and worked through some of these words, there were some interesting things that came out of this. Starting in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Pretty straightforward. If we rewind into a culture a couple of thousand years ago in the Middle East through a lot of the Middle East, and it's a lot the same today. Um, one of the ways that you demonstrate and express your wealth and your possessions was in your clothing. The way you dress and you look nice and you would have closets of good food. We see places in scripture where, where somebody did something and they asked in return new clothing. That was a way of demonstrating. In, in, in Jeremiah, it, uh, in chapter 13, it talks about the belt. And he didn't just get a belt, he got a belt. And he wore it proudly. We see this all the way through scripture. And, and so to have a closet full of wealth was a huge deal. But moths would get in there. And it's clearly not something that's going to last. Today, our styles change so quickly, right? Probably before the clothes wear out, our styles have changed. But the moth demonstrating that this is not something, it's not a treasure that's going to last. And rust, the, the translation here probably, I think they put the word rust in here so that we get it. It could also be translated worm, which are two different words. What, what are they getting at here? It's, it's the whole idea. Actually, the way it's probably best pictured is uh, if, you, if you stored up your grain in a silo, and it goes moldy. The whole idea of the moth and the rust was to say that these things don't last. And that's what they did to hoard their wealth. We've got silos full of grain and I got a closet full of clothes. Life's good. And it just doesn't last. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moths nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasure. And I think I have, if you can go through the next one here. Treasure is, uh, we have this in our Bibles translated as treasure. And, and the correct, I guess the better translation is a treasury. Because what they're talking about here is the place where I store all my good stuff. So where's the place, the thing that, a, a safe deposit box or whatever that is, where it's the place where I store all my good stuff. And the heart, the heart is the center of all physical and spiritual life. It's the character. It's the seat. And, and in, in, their, in the synagogue, the most important person had the seat, which made all the decisions, and they had veto power and all this kind of stuff. That's the seat, the heart. That's what that's talking about. So where my treasure is, the place where I store all my good stuff, that's where your heart, that's where the decisions and the character will be made. And as I said already, it doesn't say that where my heart and my values are, my purse will follow. No, where that treasury is, my heart is there. It's a demonstration thing. We continue on. And go down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, and he will be devoted to one and despise the other. The next word I want to look at is the word serve. And this context here is really more slave than servant. Because you become a slave to something. Subject to someone else's control. Willingly. To willingly submit to the control of someone else is what they're talking about there. So, no one can willingly submit to the control of two masters. What is masters? In here, the better uh, way of understanding that is not just someone who's a controlling master or my boss. It's my owner. The word is a possessive word. So, no one can willingly submit to two owners. I can't have two people owning me. Does that make sense? 
That's what this is saying. Because I'm a slave to an owner that I've decided to submit to. So can I decide to submit to, the, to be owned by possessions and accumulation and money? Or can I submit to be owned by the rule of God? You cannot do both. That's what that's saying. Down to verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. There's so much more in this passage I'd love to be able to unpack. But let's look at some of those words. To seek first, seek after, is to run after with diligence, to wish for, to long for, to crave or clamor over. God first. Have I ever honestly been able to say I clamor over putting God first, with diligence, to run after. A kingdom is probably a clearer picture here, not of kingdom like a king place where a king is over, but kingship, the right to rule, royal power or dominion. But this is the kingdom of God. So it's God's kingship, God's right to rule, God's dominion. Do I run after, clamor after, chase, pursue with everything I am, his kingship in my life? And his righteousness. Righteousness is the state of one who is acceptable to God. It's not just making right decisions and living rightly. It's the state of being acceptable to God, which is impossible as a human. That's why it says, seek after his righteousness. Because his righteousness is a gift of righteousness. It says in 2 Peter, to be found blameless. I'm not blameless. Ask my wife. I am not blameless. But in God's eyes, to be found blameless because he's given me Christ's righteousness. So as I look at this word, this verse, run after Chase, pursue, clamor over God's kingship in my life. His dominion, his rule, his ownership. And being found, covered in his acceptability. This is a heart condition. This is not an accounting condition. condition. This is a heart condition. And as I said already, those two things can't be separated. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It's a one-verse parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It's a demonstration of value. What are the most important things in your life? What are your highest values? I've never flown on Southwest Airlines. I don't know what that's like, but I read a lot about their values and their core purpose and all that kind of stuff. Their core values are a warrior spirit, so work hard, a servant's heart, so the customer is always right and I will serve them, a fun-loving attitude, and work the southwest way, which is connect people to what's important. So the girl standing at the counter at Southwest Airlines has the freedom to make decisions as long as it fits within that. So if you walk up there and say, I just had an emergency, I need to reroute my flight from Los Angeles to Chicago, they have the freedom at the counter to be able to do that completely free of charge right now because that fits in their highest values. They don't have to check with supervisors. What great freedom came with the clarity of their values. So what are my values? 
making sure my retirement is intact. Ensuring that my family has everything. Accumulate stuff. Or are my values to live slow and simple? Are my values to be generous? Are my values to be a disciple of Christ? What are the most important things? Let me end with this. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You don't have to turn there if you don't want. I just want to read it quickly. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Godliness with contentment. Not to pursue rich, but pursue righteousness. And a couple of pages over in Hebrews chapter 13, keep your life free from the love of money. It doesn't say keep your life free from money, but the love of money. And be content with what you had, for he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The promise of God's presence. So what do we do about this? As God deals with me as I read through these scriptures, there's things that that I need to deal with. And, And maybe for some of us, we need to clean up our giving practices. Maybe some of us need to take action type steps to actually just really depend on God and to step out on some of these promises. Maybe some of us need to just align our lives more with the disciple way that we talked about over the last bunch of weeks. Ultimately, this is a great setup transition into the Christmas season. The Advent season starts next week. And in the next four weeks, we're going to look at the, the, the hope, the gift of hope, the gift, gift of peace, the gift of joy, the gift of love that God has provided to us through his gift of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that we might be saved through him. I don't know why we ever quote John 3.16 without 3.17. Because God loved, he gave. Now those verses go on to talk about, in this, there's no condemnation. And there's no judgment. Not law. So in response, with thanksgiving, and radical gratefulness. Let's relentlessly chase Jesus, becoming like him. God loved, he gave. Let's pray. God, you are good, and you have blessed us, And you have allowed us to live in a place, in a country with freedom and with great blessing. And we look around the world and we see the intense poverty. We see the trouble. We see the anguish and the heartache. And God, it's not that we're removed from all of that because we live life and life hurts. And there's pain and inequity and we understand that. But God, may we above all live lives that pursue your kingship in our life. To become more and more like you in your attitude and your character of generosity, of crazy, radical generosity. God, may we become more like that. Not just when we're here on Sunday and the plate comes by and we can put it in or we put it in the lighthouse. Not just that way. But God, in our time, in our energy, in our resources, in our money, in our life, May we live in a way that reflects your heart and your character. God, give us somehow in our hearts, in our heads, and in our pockets the freedom to not be tied to what our world holds as highest values. But God, may our pursuit of you 
and the development of your character in us. May those values be reflected in all of the things we do and all of the decisions we make. And we walk down the street and we hear you prompt us to give a jacket away, that we would be happy to do that because, because we are reflecting who you are and that's my highest value. God, would you work that transformation in us that we could really be, as a church, a beacon of hope in this area. We thank you for your word. Thank you that it is living and active. God, move us and change us as a result of hearing your word and being here this morning. We love you. Amen.